We pray. Amen. I want us to uh, look at uh, Romans chapter 5, the passage that we read with Brother Ramundo just a moment ago. We're going to look at that passage a lot today. And uh, we're going to also look at some other scriptures. But I only have two points today, but I have about 40 sub points under each point. So some of you are looking scared. All right. I'll talk fast if you listen fast. How's that sound? Number one, number one, there, we recognize that there is the reign of sin. The reign of sin. You said, Pastor, I thought we're talking about grace. Well, the Bible says in Romans chapter number five, verse number 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so my grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. I want us to notice some things about the reign of sin and what that brings. And then we're going to look at it from the perspective of grace and the reign of grace that God has given us because of God's Son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross. And so we're going to look at those in contrast today. Now, the fall of man and the reign of sin started with the pride of mankind. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. You see, before man fell, there had to be some pride that was introduced. You know, the number one letter or the letter that's right smack in the middle of the word pride is what? I, I. It, we can trace all sins back to pride, pride. You know, Satan himself fell from heaven as a result of pride. And Lucifer came to Eve and came to Adam and brought this thing of pride to them and it caused them to fall. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 3. Keep it in Romans 5 because as I said, we're going to come back to that again. But go to Genesis chapter number 3. First book of the Bible there, Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 1. Genesis 3, verse 1. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree, but the fruit, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Of course, we see that she added to the scriptures there, but verse number four says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God gods knowing good and evil and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat the serpent he's a subtle subtle serpent that old lucifer came to eve and with pride introduced her say hey Take of this fruit here. You can become as gods. He wanted her to realize that maybe God was keeping something back from her. Maybe he was trying to trick her and suppress her and keep her down. Adam and Eve were tempted with the sin of pride, not the sin of eating a fruit per se, uh, though some of you teenagers would, you hope, you hope that's a sin, right? Eating your fruits and vegetables, Lord, please. Help it to be a sin to eat broccoli, Lord, please. But that thing of pride, pride comes into all of our hearts from time to time and it introduces sin. And eating that forbidden fruit was a byproduct of the sin of pride that came there. Now the reign of sin, may I say, is first of all, it's over all mankind. This reign of sin does not just affect me, but it affects everyone. Go back to Romans chapter 5, would you? Go back to Romans chapter 5 and let's look at verse number 18. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. All men. So we see here that the condemnation or the effect or the reign of sin was upon all mankind. 
everyone. It doesn't just occupy one state or one country. It does not just affect one continent or one ethnic group. No, sin reigns over all of human man, over all humankind. You and I today have a problem. So what's our problem? We have a sin problem. The reign of sin is over all mankind. Now, this reign of sin brought abundant trespasses by the law. Look with me at Romans chapter 5, verse 20. The Bible says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And then look with me at verse number 13 of the same chapter. Chapter 5, verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Sin is not imputed. That word imputed means charged to the account of. Charged to the account of. Kind of like an accounting term. If you're an accountant or you know someone that's an accountant, that would be an accounting term. But the Bible says here that sin is not imputed when there is no law. You see, the law did not make us sinners. It only revealed us as sinners. Every day, you go and look at a mirror. Every day. Unfortunately, right? (laughs) Every day, we go and we look at that mirror. And we go like this. And we go like this. And we go, oh my. Maybe ladies, you go like this. (laughs) Men go like this. And you go, I don't like that mirror. It makes me fat. There's something... Brother Gary, get rid of that mirror. My mirror makes me fat. No, the mirror doesn't make you fat. Food makes you fat. Nor can we point our finger at the law and say the law makes me a sinner. No, the law only reveals that we are sinners. And that's exactly what it was. The, when God's Word, when we read God's Word, and we see, boy, I am a sinner. The Bible says all of us are sinners. Every one of us. And the reign of sin is over all mankind today. The reign of sin leaves you and I bankrupt and unable to pay our own trespasses. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23 It says, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin. The wages of cost. You go to work on Monday through Friday or maybe some of you uh, throughout the weekend and you go and you work and then they give you a paycheck or they give you a wage for what you do. The Bible says the wage or the cost of your sin is death. The reign of sin brought with a the sin of death or, or the, uh, uh, the wage of sin brought death. And this reign of sin brought with it the penalty of death. Look with me at Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered, in, entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. This reign of sin is brought upon all mankind. And it has left us bankrupt and unable to pay on our own. Listen, there is absolutely nothing that you or I could ever do to pay for our sins other than spend an eternity in a lake of fire. The reign of sin brought upon it a condemnation. Verse 16, the Bible says, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Now listen, there are two parts of that death. First of all, we see that there is a physical death. Physically, we will die. Turn, to your, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 17. Once again, keep your finger there. Stay with me. I say, Pastor, this is not very encouraging today. I'm not feeling uplifted. Bear with me. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. 
Genesis 2.17, the Bible says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou shalt eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Look with me at chapter 3, verse 22. Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live for ever. Hmm. Now, we see not only do we have to die physically, and you say, well, duh, pastor, obviously we're all going to die someday. True. But the Bible talks about a second death. We not only will die physically, but we're also going to die spiritually. Our body and soul one day will die eternally if sin continues to reign in it. Turn to Revelation chapter 20, the last book of the Bible. We're using our Bibles a lot today as we talk about this reign of sin and the reign of grace. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 12. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 12. Revelation 20, verse number 12, the Bible says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the, what's it say? Second death. So not only are we going to die a physical death, but we're also going to die a spiritual death. And the Bible says that the penalty here, the Bible says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This reign of sin that is upon all mankind that leaves us bankrupt, unable to pay for our own sins, the only way is payment in the lake of fire called hell. Thus, the reign of sin brought upon all of us an awful, awful price. Let's say that a man goes out into some woods and he takes a single match and he lights that match and he places it upon a tree and that tree lights up and then spreads to another tree, to another tree, to another tree. And before you know it, an entire forest is on fire. That would be unbelievable, wouldn't it? Here in California, we know what that's like. We've had a lot of forest fires over the past couple years and, and have, have uh, had many people lose their homes and lives as a result of that. But you know what? Just as much as it's unbelievable that one single match and one single tree could affect all of those other trees in that forest and even homes, you know what's even more unbelievable? Suppose one man goes out into that same forest fire and single-handedly extinguishes every single tree that is on fire. That would be unfathomable. Wow! One person went out there and was able to extinguish all those trees that were on fire and everything that had caught fire? Just one man? Boy, I thought it was pretty big that one person could take one match and cause all this, but it's even greater to realize that one person could extinguish every fire of every tree that had ever been started. You know what? That's similar to what Jesus Christ did for us at Calvary. When Jesus Christ went to Mount Calvary, that one man, the God-man, went upon the cross and with one death, extinguished death for all mankind for those that believe in Him. That's unfathomable. As the reign of sin is great today, may I remind you today that God's grace is abundant and it is able, listen, it does not just forgive the past of our sins or the present of our sins, but even forgives all of our future sins. God's grace is abundant today. 
That leads me to point number two. We see the reign of grace, but now let's look at the reign, the, the reign of sin. Now let's look at the reign of grace. The reign of grace. Just as the reign of sin started in the beginning, so did the reign of grace also start. We, let, let's look back at uh, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Go back there with me. I'm almost done. Stay with me. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 22. We read that verse a moment ago, but I want us to notice something here. Actually, go to verse, uh, chapter 2 verse 9 first. Chapter 2 verse 9. Genesis 2 and verse number 9, and out of the ground God uh, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the, uh, to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You say, what was the purpose of the other tree? Go to chapter 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. The reign of sin brought death upon all mankind. The reign of grace, God thought about it from the beginning of time. You see, God knew that man would sin. And God knew that He must have a plan, a master plan. And God put a tree there, the tree of life. And He said, when that man goes to that and eats of the tree of life, he shall have eternal life. Aren't you glad today that God prepared His grace for you? His abundant grace. Hey, there's no uh-ohs with God. There's no, oh, I didn't see that coming. God had a plan for you today. God had a plan for the fall of man. Long before the fall of man, God designed a master plan. His plan was grace. Hey, can I ask you a question? Have you received the grace plan today? Have you? Have you received the grace plan? Hey, you say, but pastor, you don't know how big of a sinner I am. I remember one time I knocked on a door and this guy came and he, he said, oh, my name's so-and-so. I said, oh, okay, great. And, and I said, hey, you know, listen, God will forgive the greatest sins you've ever done. He said, you don't want to know what kind of sins I've committed. And I was like, oh, what? Like, you know, maybe like lying, cussing, you know. He said, no, I did some time for it. I said, you know what? You just keep that. That's okay. I don't want to know. <laughs> what I don't know won't hurt me. But you know what? I said, listen, it doesn't matter if you're even a murderer. You're not a murderer, are you? <laughs> I said, God still forgive you of those sins. Hey, there's proof. There's plenty of proof inside God's word of how God, God's grace was passed on to even murderers. Listen, God's grace is bigger and more abundant than anything that you've ever done. Just as one man's offense brought all under the reign of sin, so by one man's gift of grace, we all have access to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Look with me at Romans chapter 5, verse 15. Romans 5, verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Huh, how much is it? Free. Yes. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Abounded unto many. Hey, thank God that grace was provided by one man. Who is it? It's Jesus Christ. He's the one that provides us grace. And his grace is abundant grace. It only takes one sin to condemn us to hell. Whereas God's grace is abundant to cover a multitude of sins. A multitude of sins. Oh, pastor, I'm a big sinner. I'm a little sinner. It doesn't matter if you're a little sinner or a big sinner or a mid-sized sinner. We're all sinners. And God's grace is abundant to cover all of our sins today. 
James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20 says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Hey, you know you have sins that you don't even know you committed. <laughs> You've done some things wrong that you don't even know. Now, your wife might know. She'll re she remind you of them all the time. But you have things that you've done wrong that you don't even know. God's covered those too. Amen? The reign of grace is available to all. It is abundant to cover the greatest of sins. The greatest of sins. John Bunyan, the author of the greatest book ever written, Pilgrim's Progress, second only to the King James Bible, he said this, Great sins do draw out great grace. And where guilt is most terrible and fierce, there the mercy of God in Christ, when showed to the soul, appears most high and mighty. Great sins draw out great grace. Or may I say, abundant grace. Hey, there's no sin too great for God's grace. There's no sin that's too great for God's grace. God's law shows us how great our sins are. God's grace shows us how big God's love is today. Look with me at verse 20 of Romans chapter 5. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Amen. Verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Hey, the reign of sin left us bankrupt, unable to pay, but thank God that He had a plan, a master plan, a grace plan to send His Son, Jesus Christ, to give us God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ's expense, what did He pay for? He paid for your sins. He paid for my sins so that I don't have to. That's, that's pretty nice, Pastor. Well, that's pretty nice of God to do that for me. It sure is. God's grace is abundant for all mankind's sin, no matter how big or how bad you think your sins are, God's grace is abundant to cover all of them. Let me ask you a question. Have you put a limit on God's grace today? You say, well, I know God's grace is sufficient to save me, but is God's grace sufficient to forgive me of maybe what I did to my wife, things I said to my kids, things I did at work the other day, the things I did when nobody was watching, is God's grace sufficient and abundant for those sins? Absolutely. Absolutely. God's grace today is abundant to you. Hey, sin reigns, but grace reigns. Hey, what are you living under today? Are you living under the dark cloud of sins? Are you living under the wonderful sunshine of God's grace? Hmm? Kind of reminds me of Winnie the Pooh and Eeyore. You know, e everywhere Eeyore went, storm <laughs> just raining on him. Some of you Christians are like that. Say, how do you know, Pastor? Because I saw you when you walked in the door today. You look like Eeyore. Oh, me. Hi, Pastor. Thank God for His grace today. His abundant grace. His grace is abundant to save you. Who, me? Oh, pastor, you don't know what I've done. Frankly, I don't care what you've done. Because God's grace is sufficient to save you today. Hey, are you saved today? Do you know for sure that if you died today, that you'd go to heaven? You say, but pastor, what about my sins? Your sins have been paid for. You just have to receive the free gift, the Bible says. You ever seen someone come to a birthday party and they're holding a gift? Birthday's Wednesday, Brother Mundo. 
I got a birthday present for you. Here you go. Hey, um, before I give you this gift, could you come over to my house and mow my grass? It's really long. And then I'll give you this gift. It's not a gift. What kind of gift is it if he has to come do work for it? Yeah. It cost him something. A gift is what? Free. Free. It doesn't cost him anything. You and I are trying to pay for the free gift of salvation. Say, how so? I've been coming to church my whole life. Surely I'll go to heaven, as someone told me yesterday. Well, I think I've done enough good things. Hopefully God will notice and I'll go to heaven. Isn't that good enough? You're paying for it. Why, pay, why, why would he pay for something that's free? All he has to do is receive it. Simple. God did not make salvation difficult. He made it simple that even a child could believe. How about you today? Are you depending on your works? Are your good deeds, maybe your attendance to church, or your membership of a certain church to take you to heaven? If you are, you're working for a free gift. God wants you to receive His gift of salvation freely. Just believe in the name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and thou shalt be saved. How about you? Are you limiting God's grace? Hey, I'm saved, Pastor, but honestly, I'm living under the, <laughs> I'm living under the, uh, the storm clouds. How about we start living under the reign of grace? God's grace is abundant today. So you messed up. God knew you were going to mess up a long time ago. And He's covered those sins. Thank God for His abundant grace today. Let's pray. Everyone standing, please. No one leaving. No one talking right now. We'll have it quiet here during the invitation.